Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Mark Broker. I'm a senior principal engineer at AWS. I've been with Amazon for about 10 years. Uh, over that time, I've worked on EC2, uh, EBS, IoT, uh, and most recently, serverless. Um, work on Lambda mostly, but also API Gateway and our messaging products. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about well, Amazon's approach to building resilient services. And uh, there's something I believe you know, really deeply about this, and that is to build resilient services, highly available services, and great products for customers, you need both te great technology and great culture. And you have to have both of these things to be successful. And so this talk is kind of broken into four pieces. Two of them are about culture, and two of them are about technology. Um, we're going to start off with talking about DevOps, uh, and specifically closing the loop between development and operations. There are a lot of different theories about what DevOps is. Some people will tell you, well, it's a set of uh, approaches, like, oh, we do CI and CD, and therefore it's DevOps. Or it's a set of tools, right? We use pipelines and automation. Um, and uh, infrastructure is code, and therefore it's DevOps. Um, or it's a set of organizational practices, right? We have a single team that uh, it contains both, both dev people and ops people, uh, and, and therefore it's DevOps. You know, I don't think any of these definitions are wrong. I'm not going to argue about definitions, but I'm going to say that for me, um, DevOps is a loop. It's a cycle. Um, and so our cycle begins with building. Excuse my scratchy voice. Uh, my cycles be our cycle begins with building, right? And this building process always begins at Amazon with our customers, right? Like, what do our customers want? What problem are we trying to solve uh, on behalf of our customers? And then a team will start building the technology, building the processes, and building the systems that are required to solve that problem. And somewhere along the line of that, we're going to get that wrong. There's going to be some kind of failure. And I'll talk about the kinds of failure in detail in a few minutes. But there's always something, right? There are outages. Um, is delivering slower than you would like. There's delivering slightly the wrong thing. Um, and the next step after that, and what you know, what makes you successful is how you recover from those failures. So the next step after that is analyzing the causes of failure. Like, why did things go wrong? And this is the really culturally uncomfortable moment. This is the moment where you have to look inside yourself and look inside your team and honestly answer that question of, of what went wrong. And it's really easy to do the easy mode version of this, where you say, well, what went wrong was... Uh, uh, we didn't type fast enough, or, or we, didn't, you know, we didn't work nights and weekends, or whatever. And those easy answers are never the right answers, or almost never the right answers. And indeed, you have to do this kind of really hard emotional thing of saying, what actually went wrong? What were the root causes, organizationally, technologically, um, that, that led to this failure? And then the most important next step is changing your practices, taking those hard lessons that you learned from failure and turning them into a change of behavior a change of technology, a change of team structure, a change of something that's going to make you not have the same failure the next time around the loop. And then that goes back into your builders and your operators and everybody else who is responsible for making sure a product is successful. And, uh, and that's everybody. And for me, DevOps is about spinning this loop faster. It's about making the loop tighter and making sure that we have high-quality signal throughout this loop of improvement. And where I see teams fail in the long term is that they don't have the connection back, right? They build. They build things. You know, everyone's building things. They don't succeed at that for one reason or another. Often they do do the step of analyzing why that is. You know, why did we fail? What went wrong? And then... They don't do the step of changing their practices. They don't connect the lessons they got from the reason that they failed back into what they're going to do next time. And that means this is, becomes this open loop of you just make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And I think this was a big problem with a lot of traditional models and something for me that DevOps has been about improving. And Amazon's culture of ownership is about improving. And a lot of the cultural movement that's happened in our industry over the last 10 to 15 years has been about making sure this loop gets closed. 
So let's talk in some detail about some important cultural parts of that. I'm going to use this quote from Richard Cook. He's a researcher in, uh, in, in systems and systems failure. And he says, the risks that matter can't be seen from the office. And, and what he means here is, if you're sitting in your office, the door closed, or you're an architect drawing pictures on a whiteboard, you aren't going to see the risks that lead to failure. The risks that really matter to our businesses, really matter to the, our team's ability to successfully deliver software, deliver technology, deliver mechanism, deliver process, all happen on the ground. They happen to the people who are actually doing the work, the people who are leading the organization. And so you can't be disconnected. You have to be there at all times. Not at all times, right? I'm not saying you know, work, but you have to be connected to the details. And this is a great important, important thing about great leadership, and unfortunately something that I see a lot of senior technologists start to kind of drift away from, because it becomes easy to close your office door and lose connection to the details. So what are the risks? Well, obviously the easy one is outright project failure, right? Like we started doing something and we just couldn't do it. It didn't work, we didn't ship, we ran out of money, we ran out of time. And uh, <clears throat> that is easy, right? It's easy to understand. And often those ones are the easiest ones to analyze. You know, what are we gonna do differently next time? Well, the outcome was very, very clear. But there are harder ones. And perhaps the hardest one is moving too slowly. Why is my team moving slowly? Why are we delivering more slowly than we used to? Why did a feature that used to take us one month to do now take us three months? You know, why, is, why are there some people on the team who aren't delivering as quickly as we would like? Um, and this kind of slow movement can be extremely hard to debug. And it is especially hard to debug if you are even one step removed from being a hands-on owner in the organization. The other one, obviously, and, and you know, the classic one is, is outages, right? Like, well, what, our system's gonna break. Um, and some of those are really easy. System broke because uh, uh, you know, there was something obviously wrong with the architecture or something obviously wrong with an operational practice. But often these things are extremely subtle. And I'll get into some of, some of the subtle stuff that happens later in the talk. Um, and looking at outages post hoc, right, after the fact, after you've had the outage, is easy enough because it's happened and you can analyze things. Well, it's not actually that easy because you have to get the data and, and you don't always have it. And you have to understand the dynamics of the system in the moment. And you don't always have that. But it's not super, super difficult. What's really difficult is trying to find risks before they happen and fix them before there are outages. That's difficult technologically because it requires a great insight into the behavior of your system. And it's even more difficult organizationally because it requires that we are um, doing work against risks that haven't come true yet. So that means you have to go to your boss and you have to say, well, what are you doing this week? What I'm doing this week is fixing something that isn't broken. It's critical work, but it's critical work that needs cultural support. It needs us constantly to talk about why are we improving things? Why are we fixing things? Why are we building resilience into our architecture? Because we think we can predict the next outage that's going to happen. And that's a key part of resilience. It's a key part of closing the loop. So how do we do this at AWS? And before I talk about, you know, throughout this talk, I'm going to talk a bit about Amazon culture and things that we do at AWS. But if there's one thing that's true about Amazon culture, any company of this size, is that there's nothing universally true. So these are about the teams around me, the teams I've worked with, and you will find exceptions. So one thing that I think is very important about the culture we have at AWS is that teams run what they build. Teams don't... Uh, typically write code and throw it over the wall to an ops team. Our teams, the people who write the software, are on call. The people who write the software are deploying it to production, monitoring it in production, operating it in production. And that is both applies to the, uh, applies to the engineers themselves and applies to the managers. The second point is a very important one to me personally, is the principal engineers at Amazon our senior engineers, our most, uh, our most senior level of engineers, are builders, hands-on builders, often writing code, 
doing hardware design, designing networks, designing components, uh, you know, testing systems. And we try and avoid non-practitioner architects. Because you know, if, you're, if all your principal engineer is doing is drawing blocks on a whiteboard, it's very likely that they don't, aren't, aren't solving the right problems for your customers. They aren't solving the problems that can actually exist. Because the risks to your organization can't be seen with a closed office door. They can't be seen by non-practitioner architects. They have to be seen by people on the ground connected to the real details of the business. Everybody at AWS, and I, I literally mean everybody, has operational responsibility. You know, obviously that varies from person to person. Not everyone's on the tech call as soon as an outage starts. We don't want that. <coughs> but everybody, every layer of management has some role. Some role in either incident management, communication to customers, operating the business, auditing our, our decks. And that means that you know, we deeply, deeply understand at every layer of our business what it takes to operate our services. And you would have heard at reInvent in the past that one of the things that we do is that we have multiple layers in a lot of teams of operational metrics meetings where folks get together with their senior leadership and look at their graphs. They look at their dashboards. They look at their metrics. And we roll that all the way up to the top. And we spend a huge amount of time and a huge amount of resource on doing those things, on having leaders really connect into the details. And it's worth every cent. Because it means that our, our, even our leaders, even our executive leadership, know what the risks are on the ground, know what the actual system is working like. And then finally, and also you know, very important, is the corrections of errors. And these are the, uh, the post-mortems we do after outages or, or, or even after process failures. Um, connect broad sets of builders and operators. And so what happens when uh, you know, there's an outage or, or a problem in an Amazon service is a team will write one of these post-mortems. They will go through this difficult cultural moment of asking what really went wrong inside my service? What is the real problem here? Uh, what are the actions that I need to take or I need to ask others to take on my behalf that is going to make sure that doesn't happen again? And then we take those documents, often very carefully prepared documents, and we share them broadly. We get together in those metrics meetings and we talk, talk about them with senior folks, with senior leadership, with executive leadership, and make sure that we are feeding those lessons broadly across our organization and make sure that we are talking honestly about these difficult risks. This is culturally hard and sometimes even emotionally hard, but it is critical to building resilient systems. So organizationally, we focus on small teams with strong ownership. We tend to avoid ops teams. We tend to avoid um, QA teams. We tend to avoid teams that have um, non-operational ownership. They're just developers. Instead, we want small teams who have strong ownership over a particular part of their service. And this requires us not only to do that organizationally, you have to structure the org chart that way, and that's important, but you also have to structure your services that way. You have to build your architecture in such a way that small teams can own well-isolated components. And that requires careful thinking about internal interfaces, internal APIs, and internal architecture design. And one of the most important things that I think technical leaders do is bringing those, these pieces together, harmonizing the ideas of organization design and architecture into building an organization that can deliver an architecture. Operationally, what we do is deploy often, move fast. There's no software team as unhappy as a software team who can't deploy their code. Um, and often, you know, obviously depends uh, on, on what you're working on. You know, we've got some microservices we're deploying many times a day. Um, and we've got some you know, pieces of hardware where it's much harder and you have to have long traditional deployment cycles. But largely, we try and deploy as often as we can. I don't have the point on the slide here, but one of the things that we do very broadly across the organization is what we call auto rollback. And it's something that's supported in our tooling uh, where we deploy 
And then at the moment after deployment, the, the tooling starts watching those metrics very carefully. And if the metrics of the service turn bad, the tooling takes the deployment away, rolls that back as quickly as it can. And in some cases, that can happen in you know, seconds, in milliseconds. And that's a very, very powerful mechanism. It's powerful because it lets us recover from mistakes. Testing is super important, very important part of our quality picture. But there's always going to be stuff that sneaks through in testing. The other important thing about auto rollback is that it is culturally powerful. Because software engineers, we're a very optimistic crowd of people, right? Like, we're going to deploy a piece of code. We're going to see that our, uh, you know, we're going to see some, some of the metrics go bad. And our first thought is, well, that's not my code. Can't be my code that broke that. Must be the network. Must be a change in customer behavior. Must be something else. And sometimes we're right about that. But often we're wrong about it. And so auto rollback of, you know, rollback first, ask questions later, is a powerful cultural mechanism to balance that, uh, that little bit of denial we all have. Again, like with COEs, we deep, uh, dive deep on issues. And there's top-down cultural push to say, you have to understand very deeply what happened. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so, uh, and then you have to create mechanisms to drive the learning back to implementation. And it's one of these kind of Amazonisms uh, of, you know, good intentions don't matter. You can, uh, you can write a COE that says, you know, why did we, um, you know, why did we have this failure in production? Well, we had this failure in production because a bug got through our testing. Why did the bug go through our testing? Well, our testing wasn't good enough. What's the uh, action item? Um, you know, try better next time. And that's not going to work. That's a good intention. How are you going to enforce that? What is the mechanism that you can put around that learning to make sure that that happens next time, to make sure you actually deliver on that? And once you start building up these mechanisms, you start to build up a culture of resilience, a tool set of resilience. You start to build these things not only into, uh, into your code, but also into the tools that deploy your code, the organizations that build your code, and so on. And that's where the experience of running stuff in production is super important. And that's where this loop gets you to over time. More and more experience, more and more experience baked into tools, more experience baked into metrics, picking the right metrics, picking the right dashboarding practices, and so on. And it takes time and it takes experience, but you have to do it, and you have to spin the loop to make it work. And so, one of the big benefits of having teams that are deep owners is the loop on the technical side has natural connectivity, right? We build, we fail for some reason, we analyze the causes of that failure, we write these COE documents. Our engineering team, who are the ones who are running the service and therefore doing that learning, learn, and they learn how to build better next time. And something I see as a failure mode in the industry, in a lot of places that have dedicated ops teams, is engineers build, developers build. You know, they get something wrong because software is hard. So it always is going to be. Um, they analyze the cause. They, then, then something goes wrong in production. Then the ops team analyzes the causes of failure. And the ops team learns. And they become super smart over time, which is fantastic. No problem with that. Super smart ops team is extremely valuable, but there's a, there's a step missing on this loop. And the step missing is connecting the learnings of that ops team back to the engineering team so the next time you build, you're building it better. You're not making those same mistakes again. So this is where it becomes critical to have mechanisms to close the loop. You know, at Amazon, we don't tend to have these dedicated ops teams, but you might choose to do that. And you might choose to do that with good reason. It's not a model I dislike, but it's a model that makes it especially important that you have deliberate mechanisms, tools, technology, and culture that closes the loop between ops people and engineering people. And that can't be only good intentions. It can't be just somebody standing up on stage once a year saying, well, you know, we learned these things over the course of the year, try not to make those mistakes again. They have to be real cultural mechanisms, real technical mechanisms, and so on. And they have to consider both technology, which is the easy case, and people, which is the hard case. We have to get these ideas into people's heads and make cultural change, make process change. Let 
Next, I'm going to talk about operational safety and a little bit more about in detail of how we think about that post-mortem process. And I'm going to talk about Chernobyl. Now, I'm not a nuclear physicist, so I'm not going to talk about exactly what happened and what went wrong. Some great books on that out there. Instead, I'm going to talk about the operating room. And you, as you can see, there's a whole like, raft of buttons and knobs and dials and phones and cords and plugs and all kinds of fun stuff in here. And we could talk about it and take us weeks. And I'm not an expert on this either. So I'm going to make this easy for myself and talk about one button. Uh, and this is, the, uh, this is the big red button. It's not actually red, unfortunately. But this is the big red button. This is the, oh no, something's going horribly wrong button. Um, and a lot of the systems that we build have these big red buttons, right? Roll back, big red button, something's gone wrong, roll it back. Um, you know, stop scaling, start scaling. We build these emergency mechanisms into our tools and into our technology, and it's extremely powerful. And it's extremely powerful for people to feel safe in hitting that big red button. Because what should you do first? You should hit the button, and then worry about the aftermath of that. And so that's exactly what happened eventually at Chernobyl. But unfortunately, as the International Atomic Energy Agency found a couple of years after the accident, they say the scram, which was the pushing of the red button, just before the sharp rise in power that destroyed the reactor, may well have been the decisive contributory factor. Isn't that amazing? Everything's going wrong. Operators are saying, oh no, I don't understand the state of the system. I'm going to push my big red button and it becomes the decisive contributory factor. That's terrifying. It's a terrifying place to be for operators. And so if you've read books about Chernobyl, or if you watched the recent great HBO series, uh, you'll know that uh, one of the operators in the control room that day was a guy by the name of Anatoly Dyatlov. Um, and Anatoly Dyatlov has been made into a bit of a villain. He was made into a bit of a villain at the trial, and the HBO series, unfortunately, also made him into a bit of a villain. But after he got out of prison, Dyatlov wrote an article, uh, which I enjoy very much, and he asked a key question, one of the most important cultural questions that we should all ask ourselves. How and why should operators have compensated for design errors they did not know about? The operators in the control room, the people who chose to push the re big red button, did not know about the design problems with the reactor that led to pushing that big red button being a decisive contributory factor to the accident that happened. How and why should our operators um, be able to compensate for properties of systems that they don't know about? We can't expect people to do that. We can't expect people to be perfect every time. We can't expect them to know everything about the system. And we've got to try. We've got to try to build our systems, try to tell people about it. Um, but we can't have unreasonable expectations of human operators. And a very powerful concept in this area that I enjoy very much uh, comes from psychology research. Um, the research about kind and wicked learning environments. So a kind learning environment is a learning environment where the things that we learn match the environment well. Our lessons, our experience over time, as matches our mental model that we build up, matches the behavior of the system. More experience means better predictions, better mental predictions, what's going to happen if I push that button, and therefore better judgment. And this doesn't mean things are easy, right? Chess is a great analogy. Chess is an extremely difficult game to master, um, but it's a very kind learning environment. You can learn more, build up a great mental model, uh, and experience leads to better predictions and better judgment. The other side is wicked learning environments. And these are the learning environments where the things we learn don't match the environment, where our mental models tend to lead us astray, where our experience leads us to do the wrong things and to push the wrong buttons. And this is really hard for operators, right? And how can we expect operators to operate things in these wicked learning environments? How can we expect operators not to push the big red button if we say, well, push the big red button, and then when you push it, the thing blows up? We can't expect that. And so, for me, a very important principle of system design is build your system to be kind. 
build your system in a way that the mental model that people build up over time of how the system works is accurate. Build your system so people can bring their experience from other systems and other tools and not be surprised. This is related to the principle of least surprised, but you know, it's, it's broader than that. It's about build your system so the people who build experience up over time learn and make better, you can use their better judgment to make better decisions. And don't put sharp edges on things. Um, how do we do this at AWS? Well, first and most importantly, COEs, postmortems do not settle for operator error. Um, so, you know, just don't, don't accept that as a root cause. People do make mistakes, but that's not the root cause. Because everybody's going to make mistakes. And we believe that reviewing tooling, and especially operational tooling, is very important work for our most senior engineers. I spend a good amount of my time with my team talking about operational tooling, talking about the tooling they build and how to make that safe. And unfortunately, in a lot of the industry, because tooling is a fairly easy thing to develop, we look at people and we say, well, you know, we can have the intern build the tools. And that's great. They're great interns in the world. But you have to build that real experience into your tools. So I'd encourage you to have your most seasoned operators, your most senior engineers, the people with the most experience, look at those tools and think about how to make them safer and more powerful. Let's talk about blame for a minute. Um, operators are very easy culturally to blame. It's very easy to write that COE that says, or that postmortem that says, well, you know, the operator did it wrong. It's emotionally easy because it requ doesn't require us to look inside ourselves and consider that, you know, maybe we were wrong. It doesn't require architects to look at their architecture and say maybe the architecture was wrong. It doesn't require leaders to look at the organization and say maybe we need to fix the organization to fix this problem. No, you can laser focus on a single person and say, that person typed the wrong thing. So it's easy. It's very attractive. It's culturally easy. It's emotionally easy. And so, you know, and, and so we need to avoid it very strongly. And so why, you know, why is this easy? Well, that person made the mistake. I'm a manager. I have no, no responsibility here anymore, right? Like, because it was them. I'm an architect. I have no responsibility anymore because it was that person, not me. We fired them. Issues fixed. Very easy to fix. One action item. Don't have to write any more code. Don't have to build better tools. Don't have to build a better organization. We just fired someone. Issues over. Let's move on with the next thing. They no longer work here. When your senior leadership comes to you and says, how are we going to make sure this doesn't happen again? You say, well, we fired that operator. They don't work here anymore. Issues fixed, never going to happen again. I mean, we don't honestly believe that, but it's such an easy answer. It's such a social cohesion answer, right? Like, it's the easiest answer to tell your boss, yeah, there was one bad person and now they're gone. And so this is a kind of thinking, it's culturally easy, it's emotionally easy, and has to be rejected at every level of the organization. You have to have your most senior leadership understand how bad an idea this is and push back on it. You have to have every layer of people who are writing postmortems understand how bad an idea this is and push back on it. And unless your title starts with the word chief, you probably, you know, you probably don't have the enough power to really just entirely push back on this yourself. And so this has to become something of a cultural movement where you talk to your boss about you know, why, yes, an operator made a mistake. We're all going to make mistakes, but operators do make mistakes. I'm not denying that mistakes happen, but we have to understand how bad an idea it is and how it completely breaks that improvement loop if we just blame operators for problems. So there's some really interesting reading material. Um, I'll, I'll send out some of these books after the session. Um, so this one about, by, by Nancy Levison is a book that I, uh, I particularly recommend called Engineering a Safer World and lays out a bit of a framework for thinking about safety uh, in, in complex systems. So let's move on a little bit and talk about technology. But before we talk about technology, I want to talk about a dog I had when I was a kid. 
It's a very energetic dog, liked to run around, no matter how many walks you took it on a day. It was always bolting around the garden in one way or another. And one of the things it liked to do was leap up on the roof of the house and run around on the roof. And uh, <coughs> that, that served it pretty well, seemed, seemed quite fun. And so let's think about the kind of free body diagram of a dog when it stands on a roof. What are the forces in play here? Well, there's gravity pushing the dog towards the ground. And because the dog is standing on a sloped roof, this leads to two different things happening. There's an amount of force due to gravity that's trying to push the dog down the roof, make it slide off. And an amount of force that is trying to uh, push the dog up the roof, and that's a force called friction. And for the most part, the dog's not sliding, right? We take mu s there in red. That's the coefficient of static friction. That's the amount of friction there is you know, when things aren't sliding at all. And the dog doesn't slide. It can stand there on the roof. It can walk around very safely. <coughs> and then something happens. The dog starts to slide. It starts to move on the plane of the roof. And that mu s factor becomes mu k, the coefficient of kinetic friction. And a fun thing about a lot of systems, most systems, and certainly most kind of dog roof systems, is that the coefficient of kinetic friction is lower than the coefficient of static friction. And what does that mean? Well, it means that as soon as the dog starts sliding, it's going to fall all the way off the roof. So you're not going to slide to a stop. You're going to slide, and you're going to end up in the bushes. And so this dog roof system, and I'll put all your mind at ease, my dog uh, survived this incident and was very healthy for the uh, for best part of a decade afterwards, uh, but never got on the roof again. Um, but you know, what, what is the point of telling the story? Well, the dog on the roof is a very bistable system. It's a system that is stable when the dog isn't moving, and a system that has another stable point, and this kind of dynamic stable point, where the dog is sliding off the roof and ends up on the bushes. And both of these points don't really lead to each other, right? Once the dog is still, it's going to stay still. It's not going to start sliding. But once the dog is sliding, it's going to slide all the way off and fall into the bushes. And a lot of the systems that we build, almost all systems that we build, have a similar behavior, have these bimodalities. And again, We'll talk technically in a second about why this happens, but this is culturally difficult. Because my dog walked around on the roof for many years with no drama, right? So if I was saying, what am I going to do to make sure my dog is safe? Well, I could look at all the metrics and say, number of times dog has fallen off roof equals zero, and so it's fine. But we all know that looking at the, the dynamics of the system, it's not fine. So this is, a, this is one of these risks, right? This is one of these risks that uh, exists in the system. There's a behavior of the system where it falls over, where the dog slides off the roof, um, that we essentially just doesn't happen until it happens. And then once it starts happening, it doesn't stop happening. The system is down and is not going to recover without human intervention. And this is why it requires engineering judgment and not just metrics to build resilient systems. So let's talk about one of the technological reasons uh, that this happens. So this starts off with the system becoming overloaded. And there are lots of reasons that can happen. Your business suddenly becomes popular. Fantastic. You know, it's, it's Black Friday. Fantastic. Customers rush in. Fantastic. You know, you have a bunch of host failure. Not as fantastic, but also leads to overload. So these things happen a lot. And as we know in a lot of the systems that we build, load increases latency. And load increases latency because of contention. They're locks, they're disk drives, they're networks, they're things that have a fixed amount of capacity. And once you start driving those things beyond their fixed capacity, latency goes up. Well, what does latency do? Well, it increases the concurrency in the system. And therefore, increases the amount of, um, increases the amount of, of contention. So that's one loop. It's a really tight loop. System becomes overloaded, latency increases, concurrency increases, system becomes overloaded. But there's another loop, and this is the bigger one, where timeouts. You know, we're good distributed systems engineers. We're small people. We built timeouts into our client. And what happens? Latency goes up, 
and latency goes over that timeout threshold and your client times out. And again, because we're smart people, we built retries into our clients. And what does the retry do after the timeout? Well, it sends more load to the service. And uh, well, then the system becomes more overloaded, load increases latency, timeouts cause failures, and so on to distraction. Round and round we go until our service collapses. And you'll notice there's no recovery mode here. There's no mode that stops these clients from dosing the service. Instead, it's just down at this point, it's just down. This is the mode where the dog is in the bushes at the bottom of the roof. And so, you know, there are lots of these kinds of loops in distributed systems. A lot of these loops aren't as nice and clean as this one. It would be easy to design stuff if they were all this clean. Um, <clears throat> but this is a key one that I see cause a lot of problems with real world systems. Well, what do we do and how do we, uh, how do we fix this kind of thing at AWS? One of the most important ones is limiting queue size. You know, people build queues into staff because queues are great. Um, queues help uh, availability, they help throughput, um, they help distribute load. Queuing is a very, very powerful idea, but infinite size queues and even unlimited size queues or even large limited size queues can be a very bad idea. And there's a cultural thing here worth paying attention to. Um, you know, we have a service and it's got a queue and we've got some kind of spiky traffic coming in and then we put a limit on the queue size because uh, you know, this guy at reInvent told us. And then the next week we go and we review our metrics with our boss, as we should, because this guy at reInvent told us we need to do that. Um, and occasionally there are these errors, right? Rejections, because the queue is full. And what does our boss say? As he should, please make those errors go away. How do we make the errors go away? Well, we make the queue bigger. Service grows, errors come back, we make the queue bigger. And this is why culture is so important. Because often the things that make a great resilient system, like limited size queues, aren't necessarily the things that most, make the system most available in its steady state. There's a lot of crossover there, but there's also some real tension. Limit retries. If possible, don't have the client retry forever. You know, obviously what, you know, what your client's doing, what your business is trying to achieve, makes this possible or impossible. But if at all possible, limit retries. Exponentially back off on retry. Don't retry in a tight loop. You know, retry now, one second later, two seconds later, four seconds later, and so on. But one of the risks with an exponential backoff is that exponential functions, as we know, grow super fast. And so if there is a real outage, one of the things that can happen is you can back way, way off, right? You can have a 10-minute outage, all your clients are backed off to retrying only after 20 minutes. And what does that do? It ruins your time to recovery, because even after you've fixed your service, it takes 20 minutes for your clients to try again against a healthy service. So what do you do about that? Well, you cap your exponential back off. You choose some maximum amount of time. But that sort of breaks the exponential back off thing uh, because you still have some amount of uh, you know, constant traffic from all your clients. So that's something to pay real attention to and make sure your system is designed and can handle the load in that mode where all of your clients are backed off but still sending traffic. Limit retries. Oh, hang on, I said that before. Um, but do it. Limit retries. Uh, especially not twice on one slide. Uh, and then finally, end-to-end -end back pressure. And this is a fantastic idea. And this is the idea that, you know, you want in a distributed architecture, right? We've got layers and layers and layers of microservices, fantastic, nice and clean, lines up well with our organization. What happens? Well, one of the services at the bottom gets slow or overloaded. So it's next layer up, retries three times. And because the next layer above that times out before those three retries are complete, it retries three times. And because the next layer up times out before it's three, it, you know, it, it, it retries three times. And suddenly, that bottom service isn't getting one call, it's getting 27. Add a layer, it's 27 times three. Can't do that in my head, but it's even more. So you kind of get this, 
you know, layer cake of retries. And instead, what you want to do is have that bottom service give back pressure. Say, hey, I'm overloaded. Push this up the stack. Don't retry it, because retrying on me when I'm overloaded, terrible idea. Push it all the way up the stack. And sometimes that can go all the way up the stack back to the customer. Um, and sometimes it has to go to some kind of top layer that knows with your business logic how to support that. Um, and you know, if it's a, if it's a website, you know, sending it to the customer is probably fine. Um, if it's a really you know, critical IoT device, you might not get away with that. Um, but you do want to make sure that services can explicitly say, whoa, back off, and send that as far up your architecture as you can. And finally, our final topic about technology, let's talk about Jitter. Um, and the idea, a very, very powerful idea, that randomness and pseudo-randomness add resilience to our services. But before that, I want to talk about cheesesteaks. Cheesesteaks are one of my favorite foods. If you don't eat cheesesteaks, uh, just imagine you're one of your favorite foods up there. And there's a great truck that comes around, um, you know, around my, my office building that serves a fantastic cheesesteak. Very popular. So folks get hungry around midday. And because we're these flawed animals who like round numbers, we look at our watch and say, it's 12 o'clock, I'm going for a cheesesteak. So we stand up from our desk and we walk to the cheesesteak tr cheese truck, and the queue's really long because everyone else likes 12 o'clock, it's a nice round number. And so we say, oh, the queue's really long now, I'm gonna come back a little bit later. So we go back to our desk. 12.15 rolls around because we like round numbers, and we go back to the cheesesteak truck, and the queue's really long. Oh man, I'm gonna come back later. Um, 12.30 rolls around, Again, we like round numbers. So we go back to the cheesesteak truck and the queue's really long. Oh, I'm just, I'm just not gonna get a cheesesteak today. And what's happened there? Well, what's happened there is that there's been a spike at 12. There's been a spike at 12.15. There's been a spike at 12.30. And if you had gone to that cheesesteak truck at like 12.07 or 12.11 or something, it's quite possible that they just would have been empty. There would have been no queue and you would have gotten your cheesesteak way earlier. But because we and a lot of the systems we build, cron and you know, uh, all, all these automation things like these round numbers, do it once a day. What does once a day mean? Just after midnight, sure, why not? Once an hour, yeah, at, at you know, one, one, zero, 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 zero. Once a minute, let's do it on the second. Systems end up with this really spiky traffic. And you can see this if you look carefully at the kind of per minute, per second and per millisecond timestamps on basically anything that gets uh, traffic from humans or gets traffic from automated systems, you see these spikes of traffic on particular numbers, particular hours, minutes, seconds, boundaries, because we like round numbers and we build them into our systems, and that's silly. <coughs> so distributed systems have this problem. They have this problem of floods of traffic at certain times and then being much less busy between those times. We're just kind of dossing ourselves. And so what do we do about it? Well, we add Jitter. And Jitter is just this idea, it's Vegas, so I think I've got the wrong number of sides on these dice. Um, but Jitter is just the idea of adding some amount of randomness to our systems. So let's look at uh, a bit of a simulation um, of the behavior of an exponentially backing off, or a set of exponentially backing off clients talking to a capacity limited system. Well, what happens? Everybody tries at time, you know, just after time zero, big spike of traffic there. Everybody times out and tries again, and then again, and then again, and then again, and then again. And so you can see the exponential back off that's happening here. Each gap is twice as long as the last, so we've got that best practice down. But again, just like the cheesesteak track, we are uh, overloading the service at particular times, and it's mostly idle in the gaps between those. And we see this in real-world system logs all the time, um, you know, both from humans and automated systems. So what do we do? If you can get away with it, add jitter. Instead of sleeping for an exponential amount of time, sleep for a randomly selected uh, but exponentially increasing amount of time. And what happens here? Well, those spikes go away, and the service becomes much more busy 
uh, the Q, maximum Q size, goes way down, and we actually complete all of our work by time 1,000, instead of having these constant spikes that essentially go off into infinity. And so the simple idea of adding a little bit of randomness has made the system behave much, much better. And so you may be thinking, well, if I do this with randomness, why can't I coordinate this? Why can't I build a service that is like a when can I go service? And that's not a terrible idea. But as we all know, you know, when we build distributed systems, coordination is expensive. Coordination is slow. And choosing a good time slot requires coordination. It's a coordination problem. And what scales way better and is nearly as good is just picking a random or pseudo-random number and spreading things out randomly in time. Um, you know, there are other techniques, but this is a very, very powerful one to start with. And then people often ask me when I, when I do talks like this, how do I add that randomness? Like, is it, is it an additive amount? Um, is it a multiplier? You know, how, how can I calculate that? Well, the simplest way, and very nearly the best way, is to take your exponential function, so that's uh, you know, two to the power of number of attempts, right, or whatever to the power of number of attempts, times base. So base would be like 100 milliseconds, and then on my first attempt, attempt would be zero, and then one, and so on. So that's 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds, and so on. And then just choose a random number between zero and that number. And what you will notice about that function is that it means some clients will retry immediately. And some clients will wait for that entire back off period. And they will be uniformly distributed between those. And that's exactly what we want. <coughs> we want things to be spread out as much as they can be in time. You know, those of you who are deep on statistics will say that there are actually better ways to do this, and I agree. But this is a really, really simple way. It's one line of code and is very, very good. So what do we do at AWS? Um, always jitter when using back off. Add jitter as much as you can. Try not to back off without jitter. In fact, if you're backing off, just always add jitter. It's going to make things better. Always jitter periodic work. Add randomness to those timers, to those cron jobs, you know, to anything that happens every hour, every day, every second. Because that's going to spread your work out. And instead of having uh, you know, these spikes of load to your service, uh, you're going to have nice, much more spread out workload. And there's something kind of subtle here about the way that we monitor systems. A lot of the way that we monitor systems with, uh, with a lot of the common monitoring tools make kind of time buckets, like a, a one second bucket, a one minute bucket, a five minute bucket, and you say, how many requests were there in this bucket? I'm going to draw this time series. And often when you look at those, you'll see, well, my service says, my graph says I'm doing 1,000 requests a second. And the problem with that bucketing is it tends to lose the peaks. Um, and so what happens is if you actually go and look at the logs, you'll see that things are way spikier than that. And maybe there's a piece of automation that's sending 900 of those 1,000 requests in the first millisecond of the, se the second, and the rest of the second is mostly empty. And that means you've overscaled your system by 10x. Those of you who are Lambda customers uh, would have seen that we launched uh, percentiles on concurrency metrics uh, this week. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite operational, uh, you know, operational tools ever uh, because you can look at a percentile um, look, you know, the, the, the tail shape of how busy your service is. Uh, and then talk, serverless talk later today, I'm going to be talking a lot about concurrency and why I love it so much as an operational metric. Uh, but if you're using Lambda, definitely check that stuff out. And then consider adding jitter to all work in your system. Consider just adding some randomness, some random delays into all the places you can in the systems that you build. You know, you don't want to do too much. You don't want to slow things down. You don't want to, like, bind up threads on doing a bunch of sleeps. Um, but as much as you can add randomness, within reason, you don't need to be silly about it, but within reason, it's going to make your system scale better. And often you can't, right? Like, you know, you can't necessarily add Jitter to, uh, you know, if you go to, uh, you know, you go to Amazon.com and you load that detail page because you want to buy something cool, 
and that detail page took 10 seconds to load because somebody added jitter on the back end. That's not a good customer experience. I'm not encouraging that. I'm saying, where it doesn't matter, don't do work on these round numbers. We're humans, we like round numbers. Our computers round, like round numbers. We build them into our systems, and we shouldn't, because it scales badly. So what did we talk about? We talked about ownership and the loop of dev and ops, and how if, how if you structure your organization to have separate ops teams from your dev teams, you have to be extremely intentional about creating mechanisms that close that DevOps loop, that take the learnings that your ops team are learning and feed them back into your development practices. Take those things that your ops organization is learning and feed them back into your development organizational practices. We talked about operator safety, how to build systems that are kind, and how kindness sets operators up for success, how blaming operators is a foolish thing that just breaks the loop, we talked about service stability um, and what it means to be stable at scale and how systems can have these modes where they're going along really nicely and are stable in one mode and stable in a mode where they've just completely fallen over um, and how that can be difficult culturally and technologically to monitor that. And finally, we talked about Jitter and how Jitter adds resilience uh, and it's a good thing you should do all over. But most importantly, my most important point in this whole talk is that succeeding in building resilient systems requires both culture and technology. You have to be great at both of these things to be successful. And this sometimes you know, can be difficult for engineers to hear, um, but you need the right culture, you need the right organization, and you need the right technology. You know, I'm an engineer, I love technology, but technology can't succeed without the right culture. Um, if you're enjoying the DevOps track, AWS has some great DevOps training and certification uh, opportunities. You can check them out on the website, uh, and there are opportunities throughout reInvent to learn a lot more about, about DevOps. Please fill in the, uh, the after speech, uh, speaker surveys. Uh, they help us make reInvent better and help me as a speaker understand what you liked and didn't like about this talk. Um, thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, speaking today, so thank you. <laughs>